Church. It's so good to see each one of you over here. Shall we all stand and praise our God? The Bible tells us, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Amen. Let's turn around to someone. Let's just greet them. Let's just say, Praise the Lord. It's good to see you in Sunday church. If you're sitting at the back, come down in front. Meet someone in front. If you're in the front, go and, go and greet someone in the back. Come on. Let's rejoice together in the house of the Lord.
consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you have crowned him with glory and honor. So thank you, Jesus. As God, we look at the wonders of creation the Everest of the world, the mountains of the world, the stars, the galaxies, the grandeur, the majesty. And then, Jesus, we see your eyes on each one of our lives. We are a moment, we are a vapor. But you love us unconditionally, Jesus. Oh, yes, God, we are loved by this awesome God, by this mighty God. By this all-powerful, all-knowing, wonderful counselor, everlasting Father God, oh thank you, Jesus. We stand here today, O Lord God, because of your love, oh because of your goodness, because of your patience, because of your loving kindness, because of your mercy, oh because of your grace, oh Lord Jesus. We stand and worship you, Jesus. unto you, Jesus, like sweet incense, O God, and the lifting up of our hands as evening sacrifice, O God, that may it come to you and be pleasing, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus' name, above every name. Every knee will bow down and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And Lord, we, and we confess that you are Lord of our lives today. We look unto you, the author, the finisher of our faith. And Jesus, we just behold your glory, your kindness. We behold your beautiful heart of compassion. Lord, we thank you today for your blood. We thank you that we can live and move today and have our being in you today, God. Without you, we can do nothing. Jesus, visit us with your presence. Anoint this place. Anoint our ears today, our lips today. Give us clean hands. Give us a pure heart. Speak to us, God. We acknowledge your presence in this place today. You're powerful. You're mighty to heal right now. You're mighty to save right now. You're mighty to deliver right now. You're the God of all peace. And we thank you today, God. We thank you for who you are. We worship you, our King of Kings.
life, Lord. Your love, Lord God, changed the life of the Roman centurion. Your love changed the life of the persecuted Saul, the Paul. And each one of us, Jesus, stand here today because your love has changed us and your love is changing us, O God. to speak to us this morning as we continue to enjoy your love and respond to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. church. It's beautiful to see each one of you here this Sunday morning as we encounter God's love. Amen. 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 Is anyone uh, visiting our church this Sunday morning for the first time? We would love to welcome you. Request you please stand and we could welcome you. Uh, okay. Yes. Now could you tell us your name? Yeah. Rita. Rita. Let's give her a beautiful great grace. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Now could you tell us your name? Minakshi, beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us this Sunday morning. Uh, we meet every Sunday, we meet every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. You get a visitor slip, we request you to fill it in and just drop it in the offering basket. And uh, we, uh, It's beautiful that you come here this morning and we hope that you enjoy the Sunday service with us. Okay, It's great to also see Surendra. Surendra is back from Nepal. It's great to Surendra up there, yes. It's beautiful. Okay. So, uh, Yesterday there was a beautiful uh, ladies' time, and I'm gonna have us. Let's welcome Sue as she comes and shares a few words with us. Okay. Thank you. I just want to say what a privilege it was yesterday to meet with the ladies of our church and pray together. And personally, uh, we're gonna do this once a month where we can meet, and it's open to all our churches and all the ladies that we can come and we can seek God's face and. Uh, we sense the power of God there. I, if you were there, you would have experienced God's presence. And I know you were the ones that couldn't come were at home praying, and, and it, your prayers are effective. But as a, a woman, I just um, I've been thinking this year, um, God, I want to be devoted to prayer, and it's wonderful to have corporate prayer. I get strengthened, and uh, we can pray to give so much power and agreement, and. Um, there's so much of love and the flow of the spirit in that place and and it's a beautiful thing we have we schedule and we have uh, Rutika and the young adult girls here that come and worship and uh, I, this Colossians 4 2 is my uh, but God has been speaking to me be persistent and devoted to prayer uh, being alert and focused in your prayer life with an attitude of thanksgiving and uh, we are so devoted to our families and our husbands and everything else and Sometimes in our busyness, our prayer in life can get neglected and it's, you can come and be, uh, feel strong and strengthened by someone else praying with you. And it's such a beautiful time. I was refreshed. I went back thinking, you know, like there's nothing impossible with God. And I, I just want to thank each one of you for being there. We will be having it once a month. Come if you can. And, um, you know, you know, come with your needs, come with people that are sick, that need, that have burdens, come. Our God heals the brokenhearted and binds up our wounds. So um, I just said praising God for that. You will find it in the bulletin every, uh, every Saturday we will be doing also a ladies Bible study in the Amboli Church office. If you feel like you love encouragement, I encourage you to come. Bring someone out. Let's reach new people and new women and disciple them in the Lord. Amen. You know, there's, there's a verse which talks about Jesus' current ministry and it says that he ever liveth to make it intercession for us. And I was just thinking yesterday how lovely it is for the women to gather together and for a little time do the same thing that our master does, which is praying and interceding for our church and missionaries and people on the field and joining in and partnering with God and doing that. And uh, 
forgive the biology reference, but I can't help it. I think uh, faith is a little bit like the common cold. If someone around you has it, you can catch it. And the beautiful thing about praying with other women is you get to hear a faith prayer. You get to hear them confess victory and confess faith. And it stirs up your own heart. And it stirs you up to believe God for big things. Why can't we believe that India can be saved? Why can't we believe that the gospel can go out in our country unhindered? Why can't we believe that our missionaries will see an expansion of the work? And then all of us have our own mountains that we're dealing with. And as you hear other women pray with faith, you're like, yeah, God, I can believe that. I can do that. So it really stirs up. It stirred up my heart. And so if you're free next time, it would be really great to come in. God will arrange schedules and give you capacity to finish the rest of your work in the shorter day that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so tomorrow what happens? What does begin tomorrow? Bible college. Let's hear that again. What begins tomorrow? All right, we've got some great classes, and today is the last day I'll be announcing these classes. So really, I mean, if you haven't yet signed up, and if you're still thinking, well, the time to end that thinking is today, and the time to sign up is also today. So for the last time, here are the classes being offered. On Sunday, we've got an amazing class right after church service in the classroom at the back. It's spiritual warfare, which will be taught by Pastor John and Pastor Fred, 12.30 to 2 p.m. That's uh, the class on Sunday right after church. On Monday, we have hermeneutics, the way we can study and understand the Bible better. It's taught by Pastor Thul. It's 7 to 9 p.m. at our church office in Amboli. On Tuesday, we have homiletics class, which is the art of preaching and teaching taught by Pastor Kishore, 7 to 9 p.m. On Wednesday, we have Foundations Part 2. This is going to be at 5 o'clock before our midweek service from about 5 o'clock to 6.30. It's a video class, and you'll be hearing Pastor Shala, Pastor Shibeli, and inputs from Pastor John and Pastor Fred. And on Friday, we've got pastoral episodes being taught by Pastor John at our church office in Amboli, 7 to 9 p.m. So really, today is the day. If you haven't signed up yet, I encourage you, after church service, you know, as you exit at the help desk, do find out the classes again, do sign up for the classes. It's going to be an amazing semester. Do we believe that? Yes. Okay. So uh, another thing I want to say is that on the 25th, on the 25th, of this month, January, we have a young adults and teens like a picnic that's happening at Fairies in Gorai, and it's going to be a time of fellowship, of of fun, of course, of games, and of course, in, in the pool, it's rupees five hundred, and uh, it includes your breakfast, your lunch, and an evening snack. And if you're in the age category of being a teen or a young adult, request it today itself to coordinate with Wow, with Akanksha and Ruth, and they will help you in the registration process of the same. Well, children, uh, it's now time for you to move to Sunday school room, and I can see the smiles already. So as the children leave, uh, shall we welcome Ian for the first message. morning church so we are looking today at this text from Lamentations 3 verse 22 to 23 uh, all of us are familiar with this text uh, but I it's my prayer that God will speak to us nevertheless so I just read this verse through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Now this line, uh, because his compassions fail not, that word compassions is translated in the King James as mercies. And so we are more used to hearing that version. His mercies, they fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Uh, just to uh, appreciate this, what Jeremiah is saying, we need to understand the background a little bit. This book of Lamentations 
is written by, Jeru uh, by Jeremiah after Jerusalem had fallen to Babylon. And so this was God's judgment in a way on their sin. And there is a great suffering going on, a great mourning, great distress and great despair even all throughout the land. In fact, the book of Lamentations, Lamentations, the word Lamentations means to cry out loudly, obviously out of despair, out of distress. So, as Jeremiah is going through this whole writing, through this whole experience, through this whole suffering, God is judging the nation because of their sinfulness, their unwillingness to change, and there is lots of suffering. But in the midst of this, the whole book of Lamentations is crying out. But in the middle, Lamentations 3, verse 22, suddenly Jeremiah has a kind of a hope. In verse 21, we need to just go back one verse, 21, he says, This I recall to my mind, and therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, <coughs> Because his mercies fail not, they are new every morning. So he says, I recall to mind something in the midst of this trial and tribulation and great distress. He says, I suddenly remembered something about God which gave me a hope in that very bleak situation. So, uh, what was Jeremiah referring to? He was referring to the character of God that he was calling to mind. He says, I remember the, the Lord is faithful. He says, great is your faithfulness, O Lord. He says, I recall to mind that the Lord's mercies, they never fail. They are new every morning and his faithfulness is so great that no matter what is going on around me, I can have this hope, this anchor in his character that he will yet not fail me despite everything else falling apart around. Hallelujah to that. So every morning, you know, when it says his mercies are new every morning, every morning God dispenses for us fresh mercies. And we need to just let that sink in. We are so used to hearing this verse, we almost don't hear what it is saying. You know, it is saying that His mercies are fresh, are new, every morning. It's as if He were treating us every morning, the moment we wake up, He is ready to treat us as if it was the first day of our Christian life. Give us all that blessing, all that we need. And that is very interesting. So we generally look to the month of January to make a fresh start because it's the beginning of the year. But if we do that, the remaining days of the year, you know what happens. All that fresh start is gone down the drain. And the reason is because we are sinful. We have a sin nature. God knows that we will fail again tomorrow. He knows we might make mistakes again. He knows there might be lots of issues coming up. He knows that we will not be able to keep those resolutions. So he does not really ask us anywhere in the scripture to make resolutions once in a year or at any specific month. But he gives us a fresh start every morning. His mercies are new every morning. You know, you heard it said that uh, we do not live on the manna of yesterday. We know the story from Exodus, right? They were supposed to go out daily and collect fresh manna. And it could not be kept for the next day, except on the weekend. And so, we hear the explanation of this, that in our prayer time, through our devotion time, we go out to God to collect fresh grace, fresh manna for our lives, for the day. Enough sufficient for the day. And the next day we go out and get it again. And in the same way, just as we do not live on yesterday's manna, God does not expect us to live on yesterday's mercies either. He gives us a fresh dose 
of new mercies, which are fresh and new every morning. And that's a great, that's a big blessing. Because if, if, not, if it were not for his mercies, we would be consumed. You know, if you just look at our body functions, the way, it, uh, as the scripture says, because of the wages of sin is death, our physical bodies are prone to decay. But though the outer nature is decaying, is wasting away, the inner nature is being renewed by the Spirit day by day through the resurrection power of Christ that is indwelling us. And so, it is His mercies that we have that renewal that is happening constantly in our lives. So, what is that meaning of the word consumed? It says there in that scripture, because of the Lord's mercies that first to us, we are not consumed. A nice example would be the fig tree example in Matthew 21. When Jesus came and saw it full of leaves but no fruit, he cursed it. And immediately Matthew says, it withered. It became, it died right, in, right down to the root. No chance for it to revive again. Uh, we know that the Lord is the Lord and giver of all life. He sustains all life. He sustains all creation. He upholds all creation by the word of His power. You and I are upheld. We are alive today. We breathe His air. We drink His water. All freely given. Because He gives it for our sustenance. He upholds us. If He were to withhold that, even for a second, even one of these elements, we would be dried up. Just like the fig tree. We would be consumed. Our brains are functioning day in and day out. So much anxiety, so much of evolution of thought. Who is repairing that? Who is servicing our brain? If the computer was to tackle what the human mind tackles, it would need constant repair and servicing. But our brains, our minds, who does that servicing? It's the resurrection power of Christ that is at work within us, keeping us in His ways. Hallelujah. So two things that we would like to draw from that. No matter how badly we have messed up our previous day or failed the law in whatever way, we all go through that. What a powerful truth to know that His mercies are new every morning and we can come to Him today afresh knowing that He does not deal with us based on yesterday's performance. Yesterday would probably have been a hash up, possibly. But leaving all things behind, Paul says, let us press forward. We have a fresh opportunity to come before his throne of grace, to receive that grace and help in time of need. We have a fresh opportunity to receive his new mercies, which are new every morning. So even if you are going through a trying situation, we get up in the morning, the tendency is to think, I have to go to the same old office, meet that same difficult boss, same problem at home. We can slip into unbelief and into despair. Even. At such a time, like Jeremiah, it would help to recall to mind. Jeremiah says, I call to mind that his mercies are new every morning. It does not have to be the same today as it was yesterday. That is our situations. That's the lie of the enemy that he will whisper in our ears. The truth, are, the truth is that his mercies are new every morning. And as we receive it, we receive a fresh quota of grace and strength to go through these situations. You know, very often we would like to pray, 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 move the mountains remove the situation, remove that pause, remove all these obstacles that come in our way. And you will find, to your dismay, that nothing has been moved very often. It has not occurred to us that God is not primarily interested in moving the mountain. He probably put it there in the first place. But He is interested that you and I 
get a victory in our spirits, that we will in our spirits rise up above the situation and triumph in it and thereby be more than conquerors through Christ. And when we have understood and learned to live above our so-called negative circumstances, then in due time we just move that when we have learned our lesson. Praise God. So when we come to him daily, every morning for those new mercies, what is happening is we are being fortified in our inner man. The outer man is wasting, but the inner man is being strengthened by his mercies, by his grace to rise up, to live above in the victory of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We now have the offering. I'm going to read to you a few verses from Luke chapter 5. Okay, Jesus is speaking to Peter here. Luke chapter 5 verse 4. So Jesus said to Peter, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and the net was breaking. And here's the key. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. You know, when Peter obeyed the word of the Lord, he saw the blessings of the Lord because of obedience in his life. And what does he do with that? He calls the partners in the other boat and he shares the blessing. And I think there's a great principle here that we are, God blesses us and we are not to be like a storage tank, not to be like a reservoir which just stores the water with us and in us and just keeps it to ourselves. But instead of being like a storage tank, instead of being like a reservoir, we are to be like a river. And as God blesses us, we bless others. And the offering is just another amazing opportunity we all have to continue to bless the Lord and continue to honor the Lord with what He has blessed us with. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, we want to thank you for all that we just heard. Thank you for your mercies, your loving kindness, which is new and fresh every morning. And God, thank you, Jesus, that you have given us this opportunity to be like a river and just to bless others and to honor God and to honor you, Jesus, with what you have given us. We pray, God, for all that we collect may continue to be used for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.
Genesis 42. find the words of that song in the message. Okay, Lord, thank you this morning. Thank you that your mercies are new every morning. And thank you, God, that you take whatever is here. We need to turn it around for our good. Be exalted this morning, God, in our hearts in our lives, in the church, in this world, God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, Genesis uh, 42, there are three people in focus in this chapter. Three truths that we can see and what God wants to say or wants us to see in this portion of scripture. Uh, you have Jacob, you have Joseph and you have Joseph's brothers. All three of them are in this chapter and all three of them are teaching us something. And uh, in chapter 42 verse 1, Jacob saw that there was grain in Egypt. And Jacob said to his sons, why are you staring at one another? And he said, I have heard that there is grain in Egypt. Go down and buy something for us from that place so that we may live and not die. Uh, Jacob has problems in his life, right? And he has many problems. Right now he has an economic food problem. There is no food. He also has family problems. One son seems to be dead. Uh, the other ones can't be trusted. He has wives in his house and they are fighting for his affection. They all want to be on his side. They want him on their side. And then he has great confession, which is actually a negative confession. Let's, let's go or we'll die. And uh, this is the same man in about whom in Psalm 146, God says, I am the God of Jacob. This is the same man whose name has been changed to Israel, which means Prince with God. And the Prince with God is saying that uh, all things are against me in Genesis 42. And he's saying, let's go, otherwise we'll die. And he has, he has, no, he has no thinking, he has no understanding. And he's only thinking about himself and his home and his family and he's saying all things are against me. And in his mind he has forgotten what God has done. Uh, his God has saved him. On his way out God gave him promises. On his way back in he saved him from Esau, gave him promises. He kept him with Laban, kept him during that time. But he seems to have forgotten it and you know he's, he's a picture of what Spurgeon said that Christians sometimes write their blessings in sand and they write their problems in concrete. We so easily forget what God has done and we so easily remember what he has not done. The things we ought to forget we remember. The things we ought to forget we remember things we ought to remember, we forget. And he's living in this picture here and what is the real problem, the real issue is actually faith. He has no spiritual understanding of what God is doing. It's a faith issue. It's a spiritual issue. It's not circumstantial issue. It's not what's going around. He is not able to see what God is doing because he has a faith problem. And that's what is happening here. And But what is God doing behind the scenes in Jacob's life? That is of more value than what Jacob is confessing. And, J and Jacob thinks that Joseph is dead. But actually what has God done? In Psalm 105 he has sent him in advance to save the nation. And, jo and Jacob basically has no idea of that. And if there is something that we can learn from Jacob's life and there is a lot we can learn from his life. 
the one thing that we can really learn is providence. What God sees in advance, what we cannot, but God knows in advance. And we know this, providence comes from that Latin word, pro video, to see in advance. God can see that in advance. And as the song went, that he will turn it around. He will turn it around for our good. And we often correlate that with Romans 8.28 in the New Testament. But we should be careful because Romans 8.28 is not a blanket that you know, everything will be good. It does not mean that you can live as you want, do as you want, and in the end God will come and clear your mess up. If you read the whole verse, it says it's called to those who love God, those who are living for God. So it does not mean can I, I'll do whatever I want in my life and in the end, you know what, God will anyway take care of it. That's not what it means. And the other thing is always remember that verse 29 goes along with verse 28. That those things are happening so that you and I would be conformed into the image of his son, Jesus. So if what is happening is conforming into the image of the son, Jesus, then God is turning those things around to become more good and for his glory. And that's what we want to learn from the scripture that this is what Jacob thinks. He says that all things are against me, but he doesn't realize that God is changing behind the scenes the things that are going to turn out for his good. That God would send his son, whom he thinks is dead, into a land way ahead of him to preserve not only him, but the whole nation. In like the worst famine that could happen, Israel went from 70 people to 2 million in Exodus chapter 1. How could that kind of transformation take place? God sent Joseph in advance. And that's the understanding that is the first thing that we could understand from this chapter, chapter 42, is providence. That God does those things in advance. He has planned way in advance. And we can look at our lives and this is the question you need to ask yourself and say, are you happy where you are today? Do you wish that there is something that is in the past that has happened that you would want it in a different way? And many of us can look back and say, yeah, maybe. But let's not have that attitude because God was in charge then also. And he's in charge now also. And he will be in charge in future also. And if we understand providence, then we won't be anxious. If we understand providence, we won't have fear. If we understand providence, then we won't complain. Because we know, as the song went and as the scripture says, that God moves those things, God changes those things. God moves those things, turns it around for our good, you know. And Jacob had uh, deceived his father. His sons deceived him. He was pampered by his mother, so he pampered Joseph. He did those things and it came right back at him. And in that sense, like God was not sleeping, God had not forgotten, but God was turning things around for his good. And he had no idea about it. But his confession, and that's as, as like all things are against me, and that's something as a believer that we need to learn. Because if you look at Genesis chapter 1, it begins with God saying, let's give life. And if you look at Genesis chapter 50, it ends like Joseph is dead. He's in the coffin. And he says, how can one chap, one book begin with life and end with death? But that's not the end. The end is actually Revelation 22, where the grace of God will be with you always. And that's what we need to understand in life, that it is the grace of God that is working in our life always. And maybe we don't see it right now, but God will show it to us in the end. And what if he doesn't show it? He will still work things around for our good and for his glory, so that we may be, may be like his son, you know. And uh, when we think about it, right, Romans 8, 28, we think of that verse that we know that God works all things. That word does not say feel or we feel or he may. That word know is the word oida. It's a judicial sentence. It's a judge saying finished, done. We know. It doesn't mean that there is scope for debate. It just means that God will do it. It's done, it's finished in his mind, it's over. And when Christ was on the earth, and he's born in a manger, and he's been persecuted by his own people, he's been nailed to the cross, you can look at that picture and you can say, what is God doing? But you can put that word oida there and says, we know 
what God will do. We know what God will do. And this is an assurance for every Christian that we know what God is going to do. We sometimes don't believe it. We sometimes don't trust it. But we know it, that we know what God is going to do. And this is the lesson that Jacob will learn. Jacob will understand that all things are not against you. They are not against you. They may seem they are against you, but don't forget behind the scenes, there is a God who is working for you. And He will handle those things that are against you. Because we know. Because there is a judgment passed by God that He knows what He is doing. And so don't hurry. Don't short circuit. Don't try your own ways, your own stunts, your own mind, your own brain, your own experience, your own imagination. And find a new way which you think is better than God's way. It won't work. It won't work. Then the brothers are gone. They are gone away. And I was, you know, before that I was thinking of this story. I don't know if you, how many know Pastor Drew? And uh, if you know him, the first thing that comes to your mind is his infectious laughter. You can be around him and you don't understand the joke, but when he laughs, you, forget, you don't even know what, he, what the joke was, but when he laughs, you begin to laugh. He's like, he's laughing, must be something like, something really funny, because he's, that he has his infectious laughter. And he said that story here in this church a few years ago, that one of his children was you know, uh, going on the other, in the other direction. And uh, they were praying, but this child was, you know, doing what they wanted to do, not wanting to follow God, but their own plan. And, and they were praying and praying and praying and nothing was working. And then he was at a conference and he got a phone call from his home that the same child was in a car accident, in a very bad car accident. And they had to bring in like, the welders to cut the car out and airlift the child to a hospital. And he asked his wife, uh, do you want me to come home now? And she said, no. And she and he both got the same verse, Romans 8, 20 at that time. You know? And they were like praying for this child and now the child is in an accident. So they took the child in a cast to the conference in Baltimore. And there God spoke to that child. And uh, they went on to do their Bible school and went on to become a missionary. What happened there? Seemingly going and doing their own thing. But God knew what he was doing behind the scenes. And sometimes God brings those things like Ian was saying, those mountains. To make us realize uh, that he wants to take us around it and over it. So that we are in conformed into the image of his son. The second person we see in this chapter is Joseph. And uh, what would Joseph realize? He would realize the purpose of God. That there is a purpose in all these things that are going on. And what was it? It was to be conformed. To become like Christ. There are years of suffering. There is being sold by the brothers. There is being lied about. Or the first wife. This is being forgotten by the cupbearer. This is living in a land which is idolatry. <coughs> all those things are there. But uh, God is teaching a lesson. And that, that idea is learn to wait upon God. That we are so much in a hurry that sometimes we take a few steps ahead of God and we think we'll reach the destination faster. But the Lord is saying, wait upon me. I have a time. And my timing is perfect. But there can be seemingly so many obstacles on the way. There can be seemingly so many hindrances on the way. And uh, you think about it like, you know, in prison, how many years there would be a gossip going on about Joseph. You know what he did with his boss's wife? He doesn't know it. He's in. But imagine his reputation outside. You know what he did. You know what he did. But what is God doing on the inside? He's preparing him. He's preparing him. And Spurgeon said, you know, that anyone who lives like Joseph, pure, they will be lied about. But don't stop living for Christ. Because in one day, things will change. It can change in a moment. 
And that's what we want to learn and that's what we want to think because that in the Old Testament there is no one as close to Jesus in the picture as Joseph is. There is no one. Sold for a price of a slave. You know, unfairly accused. Wrongly accused. And then we will see, we understand that in Joseph's life. That's what we want to learn. That God has his timing. God has his way. God has the road that he has prepared for us in the wilderness. That he wants us to take and move us through. You know, and this is what life does is because we are created in a way. God has given us promises so that we would learn to stand on those promises. Last week I was sharing this that about this man called Russell Carter in 1800s who uh, was a very famous athlete and but also was ordained in the Methodist Church and um, he was a preacher, an excellent musician and at age 30 he contracted a heart disease and in that heart disease, the doctor said, there's nothing we can do for you. And life is like, this is over. And uh, what did this man do? He just went back to the Bible and picked up the promises of God and said, I believe the promise of God. And he went to God and he said, God, I don't know what you will do with me. But what I am going to do, I know. I'm going to give my life to you. And he wrote down that song which we sing today, Standing on the Promises of God. <laughs> God was doing a work in his life. You know, 1870 is the story, but 2020 we can sing that song, that we are standing on the promises of God. Because that is what God has made us to do, because the promises of God is what will take us through. And there was a dream, there was a vision that Joseph saw in his life. And in this chapter, his brothers come and bow down before him. And he realizes, God is fulfilling his plan. But he looks at his watch and he says, long time has passed away. So many years have gone by. This should have happened way before because God told me when I was a kid. And it's not happened so far, but his brothers bow down before him right there and God reminds him, my promise. There was a purpose. You had to go through this. Because what was the greatest test for Joseph? What was his greatest test? Sold, thrown in the Pit. What was his greatest test? That's in this chapter that his brothers stand before him and he has the power now. So what should he do? He has the power now. So here they are in front. Okay. 13 years of my life plus 7 plus 2. So let's get, let's get, let's settle the accounts. But he has none of that. This was his test. That when he had the power, what was he going to do? And that's the third thing that we see in the brother's life is that we will learn forgiveness. We need to learn to understand the forgiveness of God, how God forgives. Because as we heard the message in the introduction that there are going to be times of our failure. There are going to be times of our sin. There are going to be those moments. And what happens is when we sin, when we fall is those things come back. Our old thoughts come back. Our fears come back. Our guilt comes back. And all those things come and crowd our mind and it removes from our heart the thoughts about God's love. Like isn't it so easy that when Joseph sells his brothers and says go back, what are they discussing? He's been rough with us. They forgot how rough they were with him. But he was rough with us. And now they have to go back in the next few chapters. They have to go back and tell their father the brother's alive. <laughs> Imagine going back thinking to each other and what are we going to tell dad? We told you he was dead, but actually he's alive. They were killed. And that's how it sometimes can happen to us, that we can have those emotions, we can have those things when life goes in the other direction, but come back to God. I don't know if you've heard, but if Baltimore's message, Pastor John Love, please they just come back home. If you haven't heard it, go hear that message. It's an amazing message on restoration. And that's what it is. That is what our life that we need to learn is the restoration aspect. Like what is God done? What is God doing? Like thank God he doesn't remember what we did. Thank God doesn't he hold us account to all our failures and all of what, what all wrong that we have done. You see what happens again it's, it's, it's actually a spiritual issue if you remember it. Because when I doubt God's word then I will definitely doubt his love. And when I doubt his love I will lose hope. That's what sin does. That's what the enemy is good at. 
Like when we make a mistake, when we do all those things, what's the first thing that comes about? I wish God had done something. Where is he right now? Why is he not doing anything in my life right now? See, he's forgotten me so easily. And those things, those emotions have no place for the believer. Because we don't want to live without hope. We don't want to live without love. We don't want to live without that understanding of restoration that God has done on our side and on our behalf. And that's what the brothers would learn, the unconditional forgiveness that they received. There was nothing there and this is what we learn. This is the unconditional restoration, the unconditional forgiveness that God bestows upon us. And yes, we can sin and yes, we can fail and yes, we can do all those things. But then there is the everlasting arms of God. You know, I was reading this, no man, there are a few verses in the scriptures where it says no man and how Christ is the answer for everything. In Psalm 146, David said, no man cares for me. In Ezekiel 22, Ezekiel said, no man prays. No one is there to pray. 2 Timothy 4.16, Paul said, no one stood with me. No one stands with me. John chapter 5, the man who was sick for 38 years, no one helps me. No one helps me. Isaiah 41, Isaiah said, there is no one who counsels me. I need guidance, I need help. No one counsels me. Isaiah 59, there is no one who intercedes. But when you think of no one doing this, no one doing that, think about Jesus. Does Jesus care? Does Jesus care? He cares for you. Does Jesus pray for you? Does He intercede on your behalf? Yeah. Does He stay with you? Never leaves you, never forsakes you. Does He help you? He's a very good and present help in time of need. Does He counsel you? He's a wonderful counselor. Right? Does He intercede for you? Hebrews 7.25 We heard that verse this morning. He lives forever to intercede for us. We can put all our situations on one side and we can put Jesus on one side and wherever we have a question, we will have the answer in Christ. Wherever we have a trouble, we will have the answer in Christ. His love never fails. And the finished work guarantees us that. The finished work of Christ guarantees the forgiveness of God. Like what is, what can we ever think about that Christ is not nailed to the cross? All our sin is nailed to the cross. Everything is nailed on the cross. And God says, I'm restoring you. And maybe this year you have resolutions and maybe you didn't keep them last year. And maybe this year, but think about it. There is no coincidence with God. Nothing in your life that's going to happen is going to happen by chance, accident, faith or luck. It's going to be ordained by God. It's the plan of God. Understand this and remember, Whatever happens, whatever life goes, remember, you are, you are greatly forgiven. Remember that there is a purpose. And remember that God will turn those things around for your good and for His glory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning. Thank you that you have a plan for each one of us. Thank you that you have a purpose. And God, that you lead us and you guide us, Father. Thank you that in your wisdom all things work together for our good in your glory. We worship you this morning. If you are here this morning, never accepted Christ in your life, you want to be sure of going to heaven, then know this, that Christ died for the sins of the whole world. He is the one who loves you. He is the one who unconditionally loves you. He is the one who is promised to heaven. No one can go to heaven but through Jesus. And if you want to be sure of going to heaven, say this simple prayer in your heart. Say, Jesus, save me. I want to be sure of going to heaven. Thank you for dying on the cross. I put my trust in you. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. If you're saying that prayer for the first time, know that your sins are forgiven, past, present, future. Jesus doesn't hold anything back. Can believe in you. The sins are forgiven. Be sure of going to heaven. If you're saying that prayer first time, believing, accepting the Lord in your life, then you can raise your hand for a moment and put it down. 
Thank you. Thank you, God, that your mercy is anew every morning, God. And your purpose, your plan for our lives is amazing. We give this time, this morning, into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Enjoy those messages. Yes. We turn to the, our neighbor and say, God is for us. God is faithful. God forgives. The finished work equals forgiveness. So rejoice.
by uh, Ian and uh, Pastor Tho that everything works together for good those who love God. I was thinking like lamentation looks like defeated, but when you look at uh, Nehemiah and Ezra, they are rebuilding again. Then again, you see his book of Ezekiel that you are losing glory. Said so interesting, like you are again losing glory. But when you look at Matthew, book of Matthew and book of Luke, that Jesus coming down and there is a resurrection life. There is a hope that like whatever happens for the God's people, for us, it seems like it's, it's for a while we are looking like it's defeated. But no, it's not. And we have Christ, the hope of glory. We have a resurrection life. So we walk uh, to our offices. We are carrying the glory. We are carrying the sanctuary with us. We have a resurrection life with us. Seems the daily job is like uh, the routine work, but it's not. Every day we have a, a fresh day. Start every day uh, fresh. Every moment is fresh. Evening is fresh, and we say good night. Is fresh. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this uh, wonderful day, Lord. Uh, that uh, we have a word with us, the daily bread with us. It always reminds us that you are with us in every moment, in every circumstances, in every problems, in sicknesses, Lord, you will deliver us, Lord. You are the hope of healing, your hope of deliverance, Lord. So thank you, Lord, for all of us that we can listen to these words and be refreshed and everything is not the same as we go back. The atmosphere is changed because of you, Lord. So commit, we commit this week into your hand and all the work which is ahead of us into your hand. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Once again, we have Bible College.